Thank you for inviting me down under, really on the other side of the world where I arrived yesterday from. Uh, when I got the chair that uh, Anthony just mentioned in public sector economics, I was very proud, number one university in the Netherlands, number 10 in Europe, number 50 in the world. But what my colleagues didn't tell me in 2002 and 2003 is that you don't get money, it's Dutch. So the first thing I had to do is raising funds to keep my chair up. And the first project in the Netherlands, you get invited, four, four professors get invited to make a proposal, and the one who gets it gets the money. So the first proposal that reached me as a completely unknown person in the Netherlands was Gerrit Salm, the then Minister of Finance proposal on the scale and impact of money laundering. I didn't know what that was at this time, but as uh, luck was with me, I was invited to Canberra this summer to prepare the proposal together with my partner Franz von Waden. And it started basically here in Canberra at the Australian National uh, University, at John Braithwaite's Institute Regnet, where there were all kinds of experts on money laundering to explain me what this was and to prepare a very good proposal. Uh, and John at this time was also busy with Austrac. They already studied flows of money laundering. While in Europe, we didn't even know what this was. You know, money laundering is very young. Before 2000, that just didn't exist as a crime in Europe. So we won the proposal, and we did together with uh, another ANU uh, person, uh, Greg Rowlings, who just had finished his PhD on Vanuatu and what, what money laundering did to the local uh, community. We st started, so to speak, our first money laundering research in Europe. We did then a conference three years later on money laundering, where for the first time this topic was introduced into academia. It was by then not ever accepted or even known in academia. And at this conference, basically, which is exactly 15 years from tomorrow, uh, all academics busy on money laundering were collected. Reuter, Schneider, Baker, uh, people, and Walker, clearly, <laughs> people, so to speak, who were involved at this time. Many books followed. We did a lot of estimations. We also did a lot of uh, sector studies, like money laundering in the real estate sector, um, the effectiveness of anti-money laundering policy for the European Union, all kinds of research. But it took us another 10 years to be really accepted in the top of academia. And this was just two years ago that Oxford University Press accepted a book on money laundering and tax evasion. And then two really big uh, international journals, Regulation and Governance, gave us a special issue. And then the top of the top, the number one journal in the world, Nature, accepted our scientific, in scientific reports our estimation of money laundering. So before my retirement, I still made it. <laughs> What did we do? When we were here in Canberra in 2004, I asked how could I estimate money laundering? How could I ever find it out? Well, and then they told me that at AIC, uh, there was a guy working and he had done something very fishy, you know, a model. It was as this would be having the pest or something. And it was, so to speak, the Walker model. When I saw the model, for an economist like me, that was, so to speak, the most exciting thing to do. And so I decided to propose to the Minister of Finance a Dutch version of the Walker model. And it's nice to have John Walker sitting here. He didn't age much, as we can see. Uh, <laughs> all right, what is the Walker model? The Walker model consists of four things. It first says you must identify the predicate crimes, those which give rise to money laundering, which can produce money laundering, so drugs, fraud, Nowadays, also tax evasion is part of it. Then you must find out how much money is made with these uh, crimes. Then you must find out how much do you need laundering with this money, because you can partly reinvest it, you can spend the money directly. So how much do you really need to launder, to bring into the financial system in order to hide and disguise the origin of the money? And then you must find out how is this money sent and pumped around to the world. What I basically did is replicating John's to a big part. I took the Dutch data on drugs and so on, 
I took the Walker data, how much of this is laundered. He had expert surveys, which first said 80%. In a later publication of 2005, he said it's 83%. So I got the drug data with 2.3 billion, quite safe. But there was another problem, and that was fraud. There are extremely terrible fraud data, not only in the Netherlands, but worldwide. And for a Walker model, you need this data for all countries in the world. With fraud, we only had, and we are economists, so we are not used to have lousy data. We take the data and we trust them blindly. We get them usually from the UN, from the OECD, from the European Union, from, uh, from the US. So we don't challenge, we don't check data. We trust what you, whatever you give us as criminologists. So we took the data, which were basically fraudsters, which were, um, which were caught in the Netherlands. And we had to make an assumption, well, how many percent does do the, do the customs and so on catch in fraudsters? Is it 1%? Is it 5%? Is it 10%? We asked them. They didn't know. So we said, OK, if, if the customs uh, and uh, other policemen catch 5% of fraudsters, then money laundering would be 20, 20 times as high. If they catch 10% of fraudsters, it will be 10 times as high. If they catch only 1%, then it would be 100 times as much. So there's a wide range of what fraud could be. And clearly, that was a weakness of the, of the then uh, study, but we made it very open. And clearly, what is the probability of fraud which really needs laundering? The only uh, confidence that I had was that in Australia, uh, AIC had found, uh, and the uh, uh, Association of Certified Examiner, Fraud Examiner, had also found out that fraud was very important and bigger than drugs. And that's what also we found at this time. I just saw in the latest AIC data that it's again the opposite right now, maybe. But anyway, so the only confidence that I had, the fraud data are fishy, but at least the, the, the dimension should be the right one. So this was the first model. And with this, we went to the press. It said uh, money comes to the Netherlands from the US, Russia, Italy, and so on. Uh, money is also produced for laundering domestically in the Netherlands. And then it's sent again in a second Walker model to other countries. And we said it's in range of 18 to 25 billion euros. The, the newspapers just picked up the lower part, 18.5 billion. And this stayed the magic number for the next 10 years. So whenever you ask somebody in the Netherlands how much is laundering, it will be these 18.5 billion euros. I'm not really responsible. But after having been <laughs> three months in all the newspapers and, and televisions, I started believing it myself. So it's 18.5 billion. This report was a bomb in the Netherlands. It was for really three months. I was daily at 5 o'clock in the news for Good Morning Netherlands, and I was in the evening for Good Evening Netherlands. I was in all newspapers. I was permanently questions on this money laundering. Because it, for the first time, had said it's a big problem. It's not tiny. And so to speak, my, the famous newspaper article, the Netherlands is a, is a laundering hub, really made a big impression. What I did not know then was that two weeks earlier, in the same newspaper, in the same column, somebody else had said just exactly the opposite. And this became my big enemy. <laughs> Petrus von Deine had, and I really had not read this beforehand, had just said two weeks before, don't overestimate money laundering. It's a minor issue. Don't exaggerate. And if you he had uh, analyzed 50 cases of convicted money launderers, and he had found out that this was about 200 million euros, all the problem in all. So really, between 18 billion and 200 million, there was a big difference. And this started our big debate between what I call criminologists and economists. So what did they say? Well, we said it's big. We had somehow support from the IMF. We had support from the UN. We had the fraud numbers of Canberra and of Australia. What they said is, OK, it's small. And then really some criticism, especially of Peter Reuter, are serious, and they were true. They said, for example, that we completely overestimate drug prices, because at this time there were only one drug price in the whole world, and these were Australian drug prices. And this is the one that John Walker had used. There was no UN data. There was nothing. So we took Australian drug prices 
to multiply all the proceeds of crime all over the world with these drug prices. And clearly, we overestimate Pakistani drug prices if we take Australian data. But this was all we had. And I said, we have to row with the, the, with the boats that we have. Uh, and the second one thing which was criticized most heavily are fraud data. Uh, as Walker, uh, Reuters especially criticized that Walker had used uh, the 10,000 10, members of the ASFE were in interviewed and only 10% had responded. So these were serious criticism. We took it also serious, but we trusted, so to speak, what criminologists are doing. But what we also saw at this time that the ranges of estimations for money laundering in the different studies, if we applied it to the Netherlands, was very wide. We had the IMF, Michael Camdes, who has said it's 2 to 5% of GDP. Reuters said it's very small. Our findings were 40% less than Walker's. And then we had still Raymond Baker, with his, now the head of global financial integrity, who took wealth data who were much bigger. So there was a wide range, and clearly, it was not really clear how big is it. Well, the first account argument that I gave, you can measure, you can estimate, but even if you measure, don't trust that you're 100% precise. If you would measure very correctly the coastline of England, of the United Kingdom, depending on the scale you take, you would get 2,350 kilometers if you take a 200 kilometer scale, and you would get 3,425 kilometers if you take a smaller scale where you measure all the edges. So measuring itself does not 100% give you one outcome. Uh, I wanted to measure the Australian coast, but I didn't finish, sorry. But what, what is clear, estimating on its own is not, simple, is not just hot air. It can also make sense, because measuring itself can also have problems. Well, what, if we look at the gravity model today compared to 15 years ago or 20 years ago, what we found out, what neither John nor I knew at the time when we did the model, was that what we basically did was a gravity model. I only found out when I presented my money learning study to people of trade economics who told me, but that's a gravity model, what you do. So we, so to speak, studied the gravity model. Our measuring of money laundering goes back to Isaac Newton, who found out when he was supposedly sitting under the tree and the apple fell on his head, that the mass of the apple and the mass of the Earth and the distance between the apple and the Earth square is determines the, the gravitational force times a constant gravity. So, uh, so Newton saw that between all objects, this attraction of masses and the distance play a role. And the same idea Jan Tinbergen introduced into trade economics in 1962, where he said, well, the mass in economics is the gross domestic product of two countries. And they attract each other. And the distance between the countries makes, uh, shows you whether they export and import more or less with each other. Tim Bergen was very much uh, criticized at his time. There was no theory behind. It was just an, an equation. But the Tim Bergen formula holds till today. It's the best prediction of export and imports that economics has till today. But now it's micro-founded, and there's a theory behind it. But at the beginning, it was just, again, gravity model helping. Well, what John Walker did was basically, as I showed, doing similar things. He said the, the mass, the gross domestic product is there, and there's attractiveness. There are factors which attract money laundering, like bank secrecy, government attitude towards money laundering, conflicts, corruptions, deter, and the distance between two countries. And when you see here in red what John did without academic, so to speak, uh, um, let's say, methodological fine, refineness, but with a lot of experience, he just filled in some numbers. He said it's three times bank secrecy, it's one times government attitude, because the problem that he has is using this formula. Normally, you have something on the left side and on the right side. On the left side was trade for Tinbergen, on the left side GDP. But we, with money laundering, we want to find out what is the left side. So we cannot fill in anything at the left side. So what John did, rather than estimating the coefficients, which we usually do, the three, the one, the alphas, the betas in regressions. We couldn't do that, so we basically filled in arbitrary numbers and tried to, to basically calculate what is on the left side of our model. I have just added some cultural distance variables, like uh, having the same religion, having an, uh, 
cultural background, having colonial background together, or having trade relations. But for the rest, I basically copied uh, the Walker model. Me and basically the people who worked with me, especially Joris Fairwetter, who is my follower by now, and who works with Peter Reuter, by the way, our biggest critic. So um, what we could not do with this model at this time was estimating the coefficients in how, how much does money laundering depend on GDP, on growth, on trade, on cultural distance. And we also could not really measure the through flow because the Walker model usually says you send money to a country and from the country you send it only once and it doesn't pump the money around the world because it would have double accounting otherwise. So what we tried now with this Nature article is with thanks to data of suspicious transaction reports to estimate really also to have something on the left side for money laundering, namely suspicious transaction reports. In the Netherlands, there is similar to Australia, a very, very, very much public money spent to study criminological facts. And I think it's very important because I think that Australia and the Netherlands are the only countries where you really do systematic research on crime. And in the Netherlands, one of these centers is the is ICOF, the Information Center for Unexplained Wealth, which basically collects and keeps data, which provided also, also data for this research and financed it, by the way, also. What happens now? So our gravity model is now correctly specified, which means it has to have multiplications. So money laundering flows depend on GDP, population, and so on times and not plus. And you can see we got suspicious transaction reports all from the Netherlands, but from all countries in the world. So we got when was Australia in a suspicious transaction sent to the Netherlands and how much money was involved. We got all these reports with Australians, so it's country A. We got all the reports from country B, all the reports where Belgians were involved sending money to the Netherlands. And so for all countries in the world, only suspicious transaction reports of the Dutch FIU, because these were the only ones which we got. And we also got all the data which where the Dutch money was sent to other countries like Australia, Belgium, and all the other countries. So with this, we could estimate, we had on the left side suspicious transaction reports, and we could estimate which factors are important for money laundering and which ones are less important. So the model basically, is specified now like a real gravity model with push-pull factors, but in principle, it's again the idea of a Walker model just correctly specified. Well, what we find out when we tested the, the variables, we found out that for money laundering, to be at, for a country to be attractive for launderers is to speak the common language, to have a colonial background with the country, to have a common religion, to have physical distance which is close, and to trade a lot with this country that the country must be rich, so high GDP, and it has, has to be, so to speak, a, a low, a lax anti-money laundering policy. So being an Egmont member is a negative sign. You, launder, you would send your money not to Egmont countries. What turned out to be less important are the things here in black. To have a common currency apparently does not play a role. Migration relations did not play a role. Drug seizures did not play a role. Uh, border did not play a role. Conflict, corruption, tax havens, size of financial markets turned out to be less significant or insignificant, uh, much less than we had expected in the original models. So this was for the first time tested seriously, academically, correctly. So we could say launders prefer big countries, countries that are close, have the same language, same religion, and where they trade a lot. This is, so to speak, the essence of the tested essence of what John Walker already had assumed 20 years earlier, but now we could prove it. <laughs> if you want to read this up, the significant coefficients, those who like econometrics, I leave it on the sheet so that you can study them later. So we, we have, when we had what makes a country attractive for laundering, we tested this. And now we used these findings to simulate money laundering flows between all countries in the world permanently. For this, we had to assume that what attracts launderers to the Netherlands is the same that attracts an Australian to put the money to Belgium, namely, again, GDP, trade, and all the uh, factors which we had uh, found important. 
And our launderers basically do three things. They first decide how much money has to be laundered domestically, how much do they want to send abroad. Then they decide in which country they want to send, to which country they want to send the laundered money. And then they decide where do they finally park it after having pumped it around the world. So we did a simulation model where the simulation runs with 161 countries times 161, so with 25,000 entries uh, 50 times uh, around the world to find out where is the money finally parked. What was also, so to speak, a, an important outcome of our study when we pumped around the world and the computers were running hot for several days, we, I had my latest PhDs were computer guys, luckily. So uh, what we find out is that what, what was uh, revolved by a whistleblower once, how he did money laundering in the real estate sector, he showed that usually the money was pumped around five times through the world. And this is one of the graphs where you can see the money from the Netherlands, three million which were blackmailed, finally ended up buying a house in the Netherlands. But in between it has been in five countries, corporations which with bank account in three countries. So on average we can say if, if launderers decide to pump the money around, if they are professional launderers, it's sent around five times to disguise it. So that's one of the findings that this whistleblower was a very important one because his reveal, reveal things seem to be also the average of our outcome. So with this, so to speak, model simulating running computers three days hot, we could basically estimate domestic money laundering, money laundering, uh, so to speak, coming from foreign countries to your country and staying and money around flowing through. You cannot read this. This is, again, for those who want to keep the sheets. Uh, for the OECD countries, we could basically find out for every country uh, how much this was. And I just put for you, I thought Australia, you might be interested. For Australia, we had the 25 billion euros allowed domestically uh, and 33.9 in total and that the through flow is 7 billion um, and the laundering of foreign uh, currency, which then stays in Australia, is 1.8. So these were the findings of this money model which made it into nature. And we made graphs about the through flows, the laundering in billions, and the money laundering in percentage of GDP. And we basically found out, so to speak, money laundering in percent of GDP is between 1.9% for OECD countries and 3% for the world. Small countries suffer from through flows of money, and big countries, and here Australia is a big country, uh, suffer from domestic laundering more than from through flows. So it's a problem for Australia, Germany, US, which are included here. The biggest launders are still the UK and the United States. 40% of money laundering of the OECD countries is done in these two countries. And in percent of GDP, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Israel have the highest burden compared to the economic size of money laundering. So these were the findings of this last study. So we can say the gravity model today is an accepted model in academia also for money laundering. It made it into the top journal, so then it's accepted, at least for economists. We can use a gravity model to estimate the origin and the destination of suspicious transaction reports as a proxy for money laundering. And clearly, if we would get suspicious transaction reports from Australia, from some southern countries, from northern countries, the model could be much more refined. We can use this to simulate as many as we like iterations of international flows flowing between countries. Uh, we did the first money laundering to estimate the coefficients, how important special variables are for money laundering, and we, for the first time, measured the through flow of money laundering uh, through different countries. Now the question and the old debate stays between criminologists and economists. Is estimating better or is measuring better? In favor of estimating is clearly that you can do much more, but clearly you need some her still heroic assumptions. And our heroic assumptions are still that suspicious transaction reports are the right proxy variable for money laundering. If the financial intelligence unit just is biased and don't, doesn't like Turks and all, all Turks are cr put suspicious, then our data would be biased as well. Money laundering to and from the Netherlands is driven in a similar fashion as the rest of the world. That was what we assume here. Would we have suspicious transaction reports of all countries? This could be dropped. 
uh, crime money generalized domestically and the inflows into a country all go then to the same destination when the money leaves the country. For the gravity model, one needs data for all countries. And clearly, we know that statistics of African countries might not be uh, as good as the Dutch-Australian data. Um, we also assume that money that has uh, arrived it, that in this simulation goes back to the origin country and then stops from flowing. But one could change this. Well, crime statistics are still very poor for international comparison, though the UN has done enormous progress regarding, for example, drug prices. Fraud data are still, I think, are the Achilles heel. I don't see that they improved. We have now credit companies, fraud, they really meticulously keep track, but all other kinds of fraud, tax evasion fraud might become better in the future, but it's still very weak. And clearly what is certainly the funny thing is, we still have the parameters that Walker did in 1995 and then later again in 2005, how much is laundered from the, the profits that you make from these crimes. We just, again, took, took the old percentages. Now, is measuring better? I, I showed you the coastal paradox, the coastline paradox, but we had convictions which the old criminologists used. They had 50 cases and they definitely underestimated money laundering enormously. But we have now also drug seizures, asset confiscation, and we have leaks. With regarding seizures, I think the UNODC made enormous program by, so to speak, measuring flows through seizures from opiates and from ecstasy and so on. We get these nice graphs. I think that a lot of progress has been done. But my favorite are still leaks. What really saved my skin <laughs> was when the leaks popped up, especially the Paradise Paper, the Panama Papers, where you could see that money laundering was not just a minor thing, that this was really a big issue where all countries and all uh, politicians in all countries and banks in all countries were involved. So we have many leaks, not all became famous in the newspapers, but Paradise and Panama Papers and Lux leaks, especially for our biggest opponent, Luxembourg, who had always said, it's pseudoscience, this is what we are doing. When Lux leak appears, Luxembourg became very quiet. Uh, what I think the Walker model helps is to identify suspicious countries somehow, unusual things. We had the Vatican for a time, and I was accused, you have the Pope, you cannot do. And then we had, luckily, the Vatican scandals. So somehow the gravity model identifies or shows you very much ahead things which can become abnormal. So, for, in the Netherlands, clearly the important role of whistleblowers was the Enstra tapes. Willem Enstra was the real estate magnate of the underworld. And when they threatened him finally, that he might get killed if he doesn't pay more and more, he confides to the public prosecutor. And two big books appeared from this where he meticulously showed how he did this laundering for this uh, criminal organization. It didn't help him. He was killed in the same year in front of his office. Uh, by the guy who had kidnapped Heineken, Spear, Spear Brower, Freddie Heineken. But we have the Enstra tapes as a very valuable source to show how exactly these money laundering constructions are being done. Well, measuring or estimating, I think to find the peace between the two disciplines, we have on the one hand facts. You have, so to speak, evidence-based things, which are the tip of an iceberg. 50 cases of convicted money launderers in the Netherlands, but you don't know how big is the iceberg underneath the water. And I think this, for this, you need estimates. Uh, as you saw that in the Netherlands, if we would have looked at the discovered cases, that would be in 2,871 million euro worth. And we estimated in this year with the newer data, 16 billion of euros of laundering. So you can say the discovered cases is about 1% of what happens in reality. And so to speak, you need somehow estimates of the gray and dark scene. Otherwise, you do not have, have no idea whether the problem is worth dealing with it politically or whether you just should leave it. Following criminologists, nobody would have ever done anything against money laundering because they said it's a minor event. Well, nowadays, we've become friends. So we work together. Uh, but there's still, so to speak, Nobody would not say that we have overestimated. If you look at Peter Reuter's criticism today, it says the following. It says, you do estimations, but it serves no purpose. 
It's not it's too, it's too, too big, it's no purpose, because it's the reduction of predicate crime, of drugs, of terrorism financing, which we are interested in, not in money laundering decrease. There's a too wide of range estimates. There is no plausible methodology. It doesn't like expert service. We have still old data, which is true. Fraud is still a problem, which is true. Uh, the percentages of money loanings for expert service is completely unacceptable methodologically. You have proceeds instead of profits. You have the problem of victim statistics, which never tells you how much it really is. Um, and clearly, data around the world are not standardized. We have in many other fields the same thing. Well, since I want to end up with a proof of my study, I still believe in gravity here. Yeah? Uh, I think without having the total volume of money loaning estimated, we would have completely underestimated the problem. Policymakers nowadays request the dark number, the estimates of the total volume, because they also want to measure also the impact of policies. And for this, you would need the volume. If we have more and better data, like suspicious transaction reports, confiscation of assets, whistleblowers, leaks, UN drug policies. Uh, the problem of money loaning is that it might have a very high preventive effect, and prevention is not easily to be seen. Michael Levy, criminologist, once said, if a policeman is standing 40 years on a corner and nothing happens, does that mean he's completely ineffective? It could just be the opposite. He's highly effective because no crime happens. So we have to find new ways of measuring and estimating the prevention effects of money, anti money laundering policy because it needs more legitimation. It costs a lot of money, and it cannot show really a benefit in, in numbers. But I think we have a lot of new methodologies, and I have raised 20 PhD students who are all now working on money laundering in all kinds of directions. Uh, uh, computer people are doing now machine learning studies, network analysis, and uh, a lot of experiments in behavioral economics is being done to maybe find out also new ways of measuring and of maybe eventually finding the percentages of money which is being laundered. As long as we don't have it, we still rely on John Walker. Thank you very much.